You are listening to Proof Text, a Glossa House podcast exploring scripture and all things related to it. New episodes are released daily. For more information, check out glossahouse.com and subscribe to our channels on Spotify and YouTube. Welcome and enjoy. Welcome to Prove Text and Glossa House TV. I am Michael Halcom, and today I have the great privilege of talking with author and pastor Paul Hoffman. He has written uh, an interesting book uh, titled Preaching to a Divided Nation. And if you're watching right now, I'm going to show that up on the screen on Amazon. So this is published by Baker, and uh, you can go get your copy at Baker or at Amazon. But Looks like this was co-authored with Matthew Kim. Yep. So Preaching to a Divided Nation, a seven-step model for promoting reconciliation and unity. This clocks in at just under 200 pages. And um, yes, I'm looking forward to talking a bit about this. It's good to meet you, uh, Paul. Tell us a little bit about yourself. And uh, yeah, would be interested to hear. Yeah, Michael, thanks for having me on. I so appreciate it. Uh, my name is Paul Hoffman. I've been the pastor of Evangelical French Church in Newport uh, since February of 2007. I have a PhD from the University of Manchester over in the United Kingdom. And uh, I studied actually Tim Keller's uh, urban mission model using Trinitarian theology and Trinitarian mission mm -hmm. as a lens through which to examine Keller's approach. So I have a PhD in that, but I'm very interested in racial reconciliation, class reconciliation, education, uh, male and female, which we know goes all the way back to Genesis chapter three. And then um, I do have this forthcoming book, which I'm sure you'll want to talk about. I co-authored with a good friend of mine, Sean O'Callaghan, on um, artificial intelligence. And you know, whenever you want to bring that up, but that's been a recent new topic of research. Now, just to give you a sense, I'm a practical theologian. So, you know, my areas of expertise are what we call practical theology, preaching or homiletics as it's called, evangelism, um, leadership in the church, or what we call ecclesiology and these kinds of things. More personally, I've been married to my wife, Autumn, for coming, uh, actually now it's over 25 years. So yeah. she is a, a woman of great suffering. <laughs> um, Great woman. And then I have two sons. I have a 19 year old who's a sophomore in college and a younger son who's a freshman in high school. Awesome. Wow. Let's let's I want to I do want to talk about uh, the AI book. What can we start there? Yeah. Um, forthcoming AI book. And uh, so this is interesting. Um, so I'm a I'm a professor. I teach uh, comp one and comp two for incoming college freshmen. I also teach uh new testament survey and this these sort of things but um man the ai stuff as a writing professor uh has just mm. it's it's <clears throat> made it's made my job uh really challenging and in fact i just sat down to uh grade the first page of a research paper that was due for you know coming up on the end of the semester and uh i was so disappointed in the use the overuse of AI, as much as I like warned them um, that I just, I just sent all 60 or whatever of my students an email a couple hours ago saying, all right, when you come to class uh, tomorrow, bring paper and pencil, you're writing the rest of your research paper by hand, no resources, like, you know, no online resources. And so this is frustrating as a professor. I, and I, I don't know, like, where, where your book goes, but yeah. You know, I'm I'm certain <clears throat> at some level you probably touch on education in there. So what are you guys uh, doing with the AI book? Yeah, so the name of it is uh, AI Shepherds and Electric Sheep. And, mm -hmm. and then the subheading is uh, Leading and Teaching in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. It's coming out with Baker Academic March, I think, 18 of 2025. And just to your point, I feel your pain. I'm an adjunct professor at a couple schools. So I've had to run the papers through different programs, like turn it in to see, yeah. you know, was AI used on this paper? In addition to that, my wife is a high school English teacher. So you can imagine how much pain she's in with the yeah. digital natives that have grown up and they don't know life before the iPhone. They don't know life before Instagram or TikTok. 
So for digital natives, it's just like a fish swimming in water. They don't know anything. I remember explicitly when I got my first phone, which was what we call a track phone, where you had to buy the cards. This was back in like um, 1999 or 2000. And you didn't have the screen where you can go on the internet. It was just there in yeah. case of emergency. So I feel your pain, Michael. I feel your pain. Um, uh, the book is co-authored with a buddy of mine, uh, Sean O'Callaghan. Until recently, he was running the PhD program at um, a university here in Newport called Salve Regina University. It's a Sisters of Mercy school. He has his PhD from the University of Liverpool, and he's an expert in transhumanism. So he studies the intersection of humans and technology and how far this is going with the merging of humans and machines. Right. So he's an expert on that side of it. I'm more of a Christian theologian. So I'm more interested in asking how does this affect pe pedagogy or andragogy? How does it affect ministry? How we do ministry? And inevitably, the, the bigger picture, as you know, Michael, is how are the machines going to influence how we think about one another and treat one another. And what does the Bible have to say about these machines, right? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it sounds like a fascinating book. Kudos to you on uh, you and um, the co-author on that. Yeah. Uh, maybe once that comes out, we'll have you back on to, to both of you maybe to even talk about it. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a crazy... It's a crazy time to be trying to teach something like English or writing or, I mean, even outside of that, like, uh, you know, any classroom where you have, where a student has to do writing, it's, it's mm -hmm. just such a, a challenging time. So I'm really curious about what the writing classroom will look like in mm -hmm. five years, you know, like, mm -hmm. you know, I, I keep hearing colleagues far and wide saying things like, well, we can't fight it, so we we have to yeah. use it and integrate it. And there's a big part of me that resists that sort of uh, stance. You know, I, I do want to fight it, mm. um, while at the same time seeing how can we integrate it, perhaps. But I yeah. do want to fight it at some level as well. Yeah. 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 Um, I don't blame you. You want people to learn. You want yeah. people to, to grow. And so I just presented in front of a Christian group at Roger Williams University. And one of the things I talked about is that uh, we want machines to be tools and not partners. And we mm -hmm. talk about this in the book in constructing a framework to think theologically about artificial intelligence. Um, you know, I was reading a book called The Age of AI, it has three authors. One of them is Henry Kissinger, another is Eric Schmidt. And they were concerned about that. They were concerned that AI is um, taking technology from a place of being a tool, like a hammer, to being a partner where we start to over rely mm -hmm. and it starts to co-opt our ability to think and yeah. to create. And part of what I shared with the college students is there's God made us to struggle. Part of being an artist, part of being a creator, part of being uh, people who've been given authority to uh, have dominion on the earth. And to, we're not creators in the way God created, right? We didn't create ex nihilo. God created out of nothing. God spoke and everything came into being. But as humans, we could say maybe sub-creators of the term that's used sometimes or co-creators in the sense that God gives us dominion to take what he's placed on the earth and to create other things with those things, right? We're both in structures made of, I don't know what your structure is made of, mine's made of wood um, mm -hmm. at the church. So we, we cut down trees. And we, you know, shave them into planks and we build buildings. So, um, but artificial intelligence has the potential to radically uh, change that because the technology is so strong and the algorithms are so strong that not only students, but grown adults can start to over rely on the machine to think for us and to create for us and to help us make decisions that I believe God gave us authority and responsibility to make decisions for or decisions about. So we, we have to uh, really slow things down. I'm with you on this and theologically think through what has God made us to do? Who has God made us to be? And what is the role of technology in our lives? Yeah, so it's inter interesting to sort of frame it almost as an, or maybe not even almost, but sort of as an abdication yeah. of the, the authority uh, we're sort of just relinquishing the freedom and authority that, that God has given us to mm -hmm. 
do these things and even the opportunity right mm. um it's really sad to me uh to to see college students pay all this money and then come and let you know have the mindset that ai will do the work for them right <clears throat> uh, and and there's a part of some students i've noticed that almost feel like entitled to that like yeah. i'm paying the money you're going to get paid to be the teacher anyway so why not just let it be like you know yeah <laughs> yeah what is education is education just to get a degree so i can quote unquote be an adult and then go get a job that pays the bills or is education about part of the journey of learning and growing and you know theologically education is about growth into the image of jesus christ the imago christi that we see the apostle paul talk about in second corinthians chapter three that we're to be transformed into the image of christ do we see education as part of a tool sanctification that god uses to grow us and to develop us and deepen us and mature us into the image of god's son jesus if we just see it as an instrumentalist or pragmatic it's like here's some money michael give me a degree now i'm going to go apply it's going to be on my resume hire me now so i can do a job so then i can on the side go have fun and travel and do fun things um, is that a way of thinking that unfortunately there's a lot of people in the western world that tend to think about education that way yeah that's yeah very very true um so you know speaking of the western world uh i, I do want to get into your your book preaching yeah. to a divided nation yeah. uh, a seven step model for promoting reconciliation and unity and you and i were talking in uh the middle of november 2024 and we've just had uh a major event now i should tell those of you watching and listening for the last year um plus uh on this podcast um we have been barred from well not barred but really throttled anytime we've talked about uh the political sphere um so saying certain words um if those are picked up in the youtube uh transcript reader or whatever they will uh prevent us from promoting a video um and then they will throttle uh views on that video and then they will throttle it so that it's hard to find yeah um, so uh we have to be really careful about mentioning certain terms or um you know we'll get sort of blocked and i i was telling uh paul for those of you watching listening before we started recording here that probably i've been on the the phone with Google 20 to 30 times in this past year uh, where I've had to argue with them, hey, we weren't, you know, like promoting a candidate or a party or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. Um, and sometimes Google uh, has has said, OK, we we agree. And then other times they will still throttle. us. So mm -hmm. um, if you hear us trying to skirt the issues or like certain terms that be like, why aren't they just using this term? Why are they talking so funny? That's why. Because I would, I, I want to try to make it to where we can have a great conversation. Um, but you know what? If we have to use terms, we'll use the terms. And if we sure. have to get throttled, we'll get throttled. So, <laughs> all right, preaching to a divided nation. And my my first question, uh, Paul, because like the title itself mm -hmm. uh, has some presumptions, right? Like it presumes some some things. And the first one is that we are a divided nation. Yeah. Um, so I'm I'm wondering, like, to what degree is that the case? And we just again saw this major event happen, and we saw mm -hmm. we saw the um, the map afterward, the statistical yep. maps. And, yep. Um, boy, there was a lot of red this time. Yes. Yes, there was. Um, and there, there, there seem to just be splotches of blue here and there, you know, on some of these maps. So I, I'm curious, one, are we divided? And two, if so, how divided? Uh, that's a great question, Michael. So for me, it's not just what happened in recent weeks in November of um, 2024, but this goes back to Genesis 3. And in this book, which I co-authored with one of my best friends, 
uh, Dr. Matt Kim, who teaches at uh, Truett Theological Seminary, which is uh, part of Baylor University. Uh, we went to seminary together, so we go way back. We go back well over 20 years together. So he is Korean American, and a lot of it is the conversations we've had around issues pertaining to ethnicity or race and what it's like to be a Korean American, second generation Korean American in America. And the experiences mm -hmm. he and his sons have had have been um, surprising to me because I, I have lived here as a white male and I, don't, I can't claim to have the same experiences he's had. Uh, people have not said to me the things that people have said to him or his sons or his wife, who's also um, second generation Korean American. So a lot of that comes out of our friendship, deep conversations. Um, but what we do is we lay out in the book a seven step process and we start in theology. And so everything for us starts in theology. And we know that God created the world. He created it to be good. In Genesis 1, there you go. Thanks. He's got the diagram up. Yeah. Nice job. Yeah. Um, so we, we, we start with scripture. Like, this is not my personal opinion. Um, part of this idea of division is theological, going back to Genesis chapter 3, where Adam and Eve sinned. They disobeyed God. And that brought alienation and death into the world and God pronounced curses. And so we see already there in Genesis three, male and female are already fighting it out. They're duking it out, right? They're, they're, there's, they're evading, they're avoiding, they're blame shifting. They're already yeah. divided. They were getting along and then the serpent comes up and asks a question that undermines God's command, God's word. And they take the bait and suddenly they're cast out of the Garden of Eden. And that's where we get sin and alienation. We get death and so on. So theologically, this all goes back to Genesis chapter three. So we're not just making stuff up for drama, right? We're not just about clicks. Um, but also, you know, I'm a pastor. And so I, I have conversations with the people in my church. I know what's going on in their lives. I know what upsets them. Um, I know the issues that they're wrestling with. And so it's not just a party thing, this idea that we're divided along party lines, which we are, if you look at the recent vote, uh, the numbers aren't that far apart. It's a couple million in the popular yeah. vote. So that, that's not a big, in my estimation, that's one, 2% uh, of our population. One, you know, a difference of two or 3%, a couple million voted for one party versus the other. And this yeah. is a trend of going back and forth, right? If you look at the last 20 years, uh, one party is not in power more than four to eight years. And then the pendulum swings the other way and we vote in the other. But even then with the midterm elections, we see a swing of the pendulum from this side to that side. Yeah. There's obviously racial issues. We saw that in 2020 that exploded um, for people of color, people that are non-Anglos, people of uh, black and brown skin. They could tell you this has been going on a long time. It's been going on a long time. So in the book, we address, I would say, what we call the four isms. We have partisanism, which is party. We actually see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where uh, people are dividing over Paul and Apollos. I like this one and I like that one, right? That's what parties are. It's, it's very personality driven, especially in recent decades. But that's in scripture, where the apostle Paul confronts that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We see sexism. That goes back to Genesis chapter 3. The, the divide between male and female, right? We just talked about that. We see classism, which we see in James chapter one and James chapter two, excuse me, rich and poor, um, where James has to tell the rich people, stop going in and uh, during the, the feast, eating all the food and leaving nothing for the poor people. And he rebukes them in James chapter uh, two. And so um, We've got, what is the other? We have, uh, what did I say? Racism or ethnic, ethnocentrism, partisanism, which is party, uh, sexism and classism. So we have what we call the four isms we address in the book and all four are found in scripture. Hmm. Interesting. So the, the wheel here that we're looking at on the screen, we start with theology, contextual, personal, positional, methodological, practical, mm -hmm. categorical. Yep. Um, so just on a tangent here you're so you, you mentioned again you're a pastor um efc newport church which says the evangelical friends church tell us a little bit about the friends then we'll circle back to the book. yeah yeah thank you for that you're 
working into the contextual step here as a good theologian. Um, yeah, Evangelical Friends Church uh, originally has Quaker heritage. And so uh, that's an Anabaptist movement that came out of a group of dissenters that was part of the dissenting movement in England against the Church of England or the Anglican Church back in the 1600s. Uh, Evangelical Friends or uh, the Religious Society of Friends goes back to a guy named George Fox, who was essentially looking uh, for answers. He was going to Anglican priest after Anglican priest. He wanted to know God directly. He he wanted more than, you know, he wanted a personal relationship with God. And back then it was uh, primarily mediated through the Anglican church, through the priests, through the sacraments and so on. And he kept asking these priests these deep questions and he, he wasn't getting the responses he wanted. He was obviously concerned about hypocrisy, um, you know, stuff we don't deal with anymore, uh, Michael. Right. <laughs> um, and so anyway, he uh, had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ where he heard the voice of God speaking to him. And he came to know Jesus personally and individually, that Jesus Christ died for his sins. But the movement was different in that they said anyone can preach the gospel, male or female, um, adult or child. If you believe in Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit. You are given the gifts to go and to speak about Jesus to other people. So it was one of the fastest growing movements at one point in the uh, Western world because they were not allowed to be in Anglican churches. So they'd preach wherever they could. They, they would go to the fields. They'd go to the forests. They'd go to public squares. They'd go to houses. They believe we can talk about God and scripture anywhere there are people. Hmm. All right. So, um, well, a lot of the Anabaptist folks, right? Like they, they sort of eschew politics. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, um, I have some Anabaptist friends who, you know, like refuse to participate in any sort of political system or, you know, passing a vote or anything like that. Yep. Um, so, so we have the in your book you're talking about the uh these these four isms yep. um and all right here here's maybe a uh out of left field question <laughs> for you. Okay. <laughs> um so I I do stand up comedy like I love comedy mm. and um one of the things I I you may totally disagree with me on this by the way. Um <laughs> One of the things that I I feel like um, we've lost is the ability to laugh hmm. in the face of those isms you're talking about. Yeah. So, um, now, like from from where I sit, like I do think stereotypes are at some level a thing, you know, and hmm. you know uh, the, the weather and you know, whatever degree to which they're true or accurate, whatever, like, but, yeah. you know, I do think that stereotypes are a thing. Yep. And, um, I, they, you know, a lot of jokes like rest on those stereotypes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but we've, I, I think like as a theologian, as a comedian, like one of the things that has hurt us is the, the loss of ability to laugh those yep. things together yes uh, so i'm curious about your thoughts on that yeah i i appreciate that michael that you're uh that takes guts to get up <laughs> and to crack jokes in front of people right and and live immediate response so comics are some of the bravest people i know because they got to get up there they have material but also they have to be willing to um, address a live audience and hecklers and these kinds of things so they're they're incredibly brave um, incredibly sharp verbally. They got to learn to spar with people. Right. But to your point, I would say, yes, we as a culture, um, we become overly reactive, overly defensive. Um, my approach to life is I tell people, I take God very seriously, but human beings, you know, we don't need to take ourselves overly seriously. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes we take ourselves too seriously. Like we're people with belly buttons. Like what is a belly button? We're people with you know, freckles were people with, um, white hair, you know, like we, it's just, you're human beings. You're going to be here 80 years and then you're dust, right? The, the scripture right. Ecclesiastes where the Hebrew word is Hebel. We are vapor. We are a mist. We're just here for such, such a little period of time. And God values us as his image bearers 
but we're not God. Like God is holy. God is majestic. And so I take God very seriously. Uh, profanity in the sense of taking God's name in vain. I, I have a problem with that um, because on sake of God, not that God needs me to defend him. God can take care of himself. I'm pretty sure scripture bears that out over and over. But as when it comes to people, yeah, I think we're taking ourselves too seriously. I think um, I think this is part of social media is, is the algorithms are based on outrage. And so there are people that just throw rhetorical bombs. They say the craziest things they can think of so that they can trend. And I've seen this over and over again, and this has been studied, uh, that people that want to trend, you just say the most uh, sexist, racist, or whatever stuff you might not even believe, but you want to get people upset because the algorithm is set up for outrage. And if you say some outrageous things, other people pile on and they like, and they retweet and they share, and suddenly you're trending. And suddenly, yeah. you know, you're a thing. I, I learned a lot about this, Michael, a couple of years ago, I was a property manager for a guy that was a CEO of a software company. And he uh, took my wife and I out for dinner one time and he was talking about, you know, uh, as a software company that was a competitor of Microsoft, he said, there's actually a hierarchy to uh, PR and to news. He said, you wouldn't think this, but he said, number one, you want good news or good promotion. But if you can't get good news or good promotion, number two is bad news or right. negative attention, because at least the negative tension, you're relevant, you're out there. People right. know who you are, even if it's negative, then you've got their attention, at least maybe you can convince them. But then the third uh, order of preference is no news or no attention, then you're just irrelevant. So it's better okay. to have negative news and negative attention than no attention. Yeah. And I just never thought of that before. But that illustrates, in a nutshell, social media and the internet for you. Yeah, well, I, I think, um... I think for all the uh, the the media outlets that have such disdain uh, for the Donald, right? Um, <laughs> they, yeah. they have not learned that lesson over nine years. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, yeah. That, you know that they, they, he's been kept in the news daily. Like yep. it's it's yep. pretty astounding. Um, but you know, like. Yeah, I don't know. I think this is interesting, like those isms. Like, I think, you know, we should be able to laugh at those things together. Some of those yeah. things are hilarious. Yep. Um, and obviously, when they're said in jest, uh, that's something completely different than when they're said in a manner that's meant to to hurt or, you know, tear someone down. Yep. Um, but... Yeah, I don't know. I, I think about that quite often, and especially as like uh, a, a Christian who's doing comedy and, um, you know, working in these spaces. I, I find it. Yeah, I find it for refreshing when I when I hear somebody just stand up and, and crack jokes on these things that have that this, it seems like in just recent years, they've become like like golden calves or, or like. Mm -hmm. I don't know, like these sacred things that we just can't touch or handle yeah. Yeah. anymore. Like, it wasn't that way, and I, I don't mean to be the old guy sounding nostalgic, bro. Like, but <laughs> it wasn't that way when I was growing up, just a few decades ago. Like yeah. the the sort of like disses and rips that me, like me and my childhood friends, laid on each other every day. Like mm. that was, you know, there was there was a lot of fun there, and. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. So, uh, yeah, I'm I'm kind of tangenting here, but um, <laughs> I I think, you know, I, I think there's something to that. Yeah. And, yeah. You know when? So I haven't made it all the way through the book yet, and so I don't know exactly how all the isms are discussed and um, sure. you know that sort of thing. But I do feel like people are have been pretty uptight about those things. Yes. Yeah. I would agree with you. I think, again, we're thin skinned. We tend to be more thin skinned than we were. I, I will nuance what you're saying. I think it's okay for people to, it's one thing to have conversation with someone, you know, behind closed doors, me and my friends, the way we can even talk about, say, for example, race privately, because we have trust established is different than how we might talk about it publicly, because then people freak out. Um, so to me, there's certain things I can say to people I know behind closed doors that we're just sharing. Honestly, we can ask good questions, but if you say it in a public venue, people start to freak out 
even if you're saying like, I'm just trying to understand, I'm trying to, um, I, I don't get it. Like, I'm not saying I'm buying into this ideology or whatever. I just want to know more about it. But there is something for humor. And I, I found it's interesting. The person that's gotten a lot of that pushback, I don't agree with everything he says. Some of it is uh, crass is Dave Chappelle. Uh, Dave right. Chappelle, some of his critique of, of race and other issues, uh, sex and gender in America is fascinating. Yes. Um, some of the stuff he says, I'm like, ouch, okay. That's, you know, some of the language as a Christian, I don't, I don't prefer it. Obviously it could be very crass, but some of the points he's making are really insightful. And then he'll say something just to get people riled up. But I'm like, but listening to what he, listen to what he's saying beneath that. And then the right. whole cancel thing is you have groups of people trying to cancel him. And I'm like, so you have a black man that's trying to be canceled. Um, like what's going on. So who gets to cancel him? Um, is it racist of white people, but they're white females that are pro LGBTQ plus, like if right. they cancel him, is that not racism? And that's where identity politics, when it goes really, really far is just this group versus this group versus this group. And I, I want people to have good, honest conversations about things that upset us or things we care passionately about, but we do need to temper it with the fact that in the end we're humans. I think there are people that say things that are not mal-tempered or, or ill-tempered. Um, and so I've learned that, you know, we, we need to learn to believe the best about people or at least try to extend some grace, try and believe the best. Um, but then um, there's times you can say, well, I disagree with that or I wouldn't say it that way. So, and, and how can we, again, have humor, uh, be lighthearted, but not take everything, every yeah. single thing seriously. And right. so, but, but to, to your point, I would say when I make humor, I'm going to make, I can, I feel comfortable making front fun of men. Cause I'm a man now making fun of women. I don't think I would do that necessarily publicly. Uh, first off, cause I got to come home to my wife and I'm not afraid of other women, but my wife, when she gets upset, um, she'll, she'll call me the carpet. Um, and I also wouldn't want to offend her and she's not a snowflake. She's not someone that's easily, easily offended, but. I guess it, you know, this is a question I asked in my PhD research, who gets to critique who and who gets to humor who? And generally a member of an in-group, right? If you're from Tennessee mm -hmm. and you make a joke about Tennesseans, you should be okay, I think. But if I'm, yeah. you know, I'm from Maine. So if I come and make a joke about Tennesseans, Tennesseans are like, whoa, bro, I'm sorry. You don't get to say that. You're a Mainer, okay? But Tennesseans, they can say what they want about their own family, right? Yeah. <laughs> but if you come after my family, now we're having a different conversation. It's, that's funny. Like, so I, I'll get back to the book in a second, but just a couple weeks ago, I was on a show in South Carolina and um, this is my first time ever performing in South Carolina. Mm. Packed out room. This, it, was, it was a really fun 30 minutes for me. And um, early on in the set, <laughs> there was a string of jokes. Uh, just so uh, that week, uh, which uh, forty three monkeys had escaped this yep. science lab, yep. right in South Carolina. So, um, and I when I got up, like uh, you know, I was talking about we we've, we've heard all week about make America great again, but what about make America safe again? I come to South Carolina to perform for the first time, and there are forty three <laughs> monkeys on the loose, right? Well, <laughs> and then. The, the joke, the place just erupted, right? Yeah. Um, and then the, the follow-up, it was a string of these monkey jokes, but the follow-up yeah. was, all right, now, some of y'all, I know you live here in South Carolina, and some of y'all were probably born and raised here, but be honest, did you know, so the, these monkeys, right, they escaped from a science lab, so it's like, did you know they did science in South Carolina, right? No. <laughs> And the, the, again, the place just erupted, right? So, yeah. um, and it's it's really like an angle, right? How you come at it, um, you know. I had a I had a joke later in the set that didn't hit as hard about that area. Like, uh, mm. it was something to the effect of, you know, this is the sixth most dangerous city in all of South Carolina. Mm. You know, uh, and then I was talking about driving down one of the the roads there and how scary that was and dude, that didn't hit as hard it got some laughs but um mm. so you know like you're right there is the in group out group insider outsider dynamic yep. and that's just that's part of reading the room too 
right? Yep. As you're talking yep. about when you're with your your close buddies or whatever behind closed doors, you you know, you don't have to try as hard to read the room. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's, it's hard to read the room of a nation. And so at, at some level you're you're trying to do that in the book. Like yeah. you're talking about, you know, preaching to a divided nation. I'm I'm curious, um, what does this look like in your local congregation, like your local yeah. hotel? Yeah. So thanks for asking that. And I appreciate your humor and I appreciate you understand. You don't, you don't strike me, Michael, as someone that's mean spirited or I don't think you're going after. So I, I hope people would, you know, grant you a sense of grace. And it sounds like most of the jokes landed, but that's part of being a comedian is not everything lands. Any, anytime you communicate with another person, there's risk because you're making yourself vulnerable by speaking your thoughts. So yeah. um, that's a whole other conversation that we forget how risky communication just in general is to say anything or do anything is to expose oneself. But um, in terms of the book, yeah, we, I mean, a lot of it is based on what I've learned pastoring a church and our church is what we call purple. We have both parties, both major parties in the church. Um, because even though we're in Rhode Island, which tends to be a blue state, um, we have a lot of uh, military, active duty military, because I live two miles from the U.S. Naval uh, War College and NAVS to Newport is what it's called. It's a big naval station here that has uh, a number of schools. Um, they have a justice school. They have NAPS, which is a naval academy preparatory school, the War College and so forth and so on. So we have people in the military that are from all over the United States. And then there's a, there's, there's people that actually come to study from all over the globe that will come to Newport because we have a reciprocal relationship with other mm -hmm. countries. So like Nigeria and Mexico and, you know, people, uh, the Philippines. And so we have people in our church that have actually from all over the world. Um, so I've learned just by the relate the, the way that we have conversations um, even though our state leans one direction, we have people that are from literally all over the United States and all over the world. So mm -hmm. I, I try and be curious, uh, Michael, and I, I get that about you uh, as an educator, as a thinker, as a person, you're curious. And so mm -hmm. you want to know about other people, how they think. What do they think about the state I live in, Rhode Island? If you're from outside the United States, what do you think about our country? What are your perceptions? I'm curious. I want to know what other people think because right. I'm just one of 340 million people um, in this country. So what the whole seven step process in the book was developed both as a trained theologian, but also as someone that pastors people, people that their marriage is hurting, their kids are struggling. Uh, there's addiction issues. There, there's financial struggles. Um, they don't get along with their neighbor. Um, I'm having health issues. And so you start to, to learn what, uh, people are wrestling with who they are, what they care about, what scares them. And that's a lot of where the book came from. And actually, we talk about that in the second step or the second chapter is the contextual step, which is, um, do you know the history of your own community? Because mm -hmm. every place is different. Like Newport, Rhode Island, where I live, is even different than a couple towns over. Coventry, Rhode Island, where mm -hmm. I went to a football game recently. Very different uh, mm -hmm. makeup than even Newport, Rhode Island. So um the the makeup of the ethnicity is different e ethnic makeup the educational makeup the kind of people you have coventry tends to be more people that are local from rhode island whereas newport mm -hmm. rhode island we have a sailing community we have a tourism community we have tourists we have the war college we have people coming through here all the time that are not from here even though it's an island which is geographically islands tend to be geographically isolated there's only three ways on and off there's there's three bridges unless you want to swim or take a stand up paddle board or whatever you got your own private boat or you want to swim there's only three ways three major bridges on and off the island so you know i i meet honestly i have people every week guests every week in my church just mm -hmm. met a new guy yesterday um who is stationed new right you know fresh out of uh officer candidate school and he's stationed in um hawaii and he flew all day Saturday to get to Newport. And he's going to be here for like four or five weeks. And he showed up in church. So I'm meeting this guy for the first time. It's interesting you mentioned that. So I'm in North Carolina when we're recording, but I live in Hawaii. Like it's where my family is. Mm. Um, so I'm assuming since he's on from Hawaii, he's from Oahu, you know, yep. it's a military, military yep. base central. But 
Um, yeah, same, you know, very, very similar seeing the, the mixed demographics. So like um, the, the subtitle of, yep. of the book is interesting too, right? A seven step model for promoting reconciliation and unity. Um, what about when reconciliation isn't possible? Yeah, yeah. Well, to, to one point, just to the subheading, I want to make clear to your um, your listeners and those watching that the book is more than just for uh, formal pastors, okay? Uh, the book is for Christians, because we are Christians and theologians, but it's for anyone that cares about reconciliation, about unity. So it, it could be for youth group leaders. It can be for Bible study or small group leaders. It can be for church boards. It can be for ministry students. It's not just for people who ordain ministers that preach week in and week out. We, the way we made the book is, is broad enough to encompass a lot of people that care about God, that do ministry or training for ministry. Um, so I just want to make that clear. It actually won, ironically, um, it won an Outreach Magazine a Book of the Year Award for leadership, not even for not communication, but in the category of leadership. So they they saw it as a leadership book, which we're very honored and privileged by that. So mm-hmm. I just want to say that back to your, your your question. There are times where people cannot get along and maybe they need to agree to disagree. But I would argue that if if we're both Christians, there's nothing that should separate us ultimately because in Jesus Christ, theologically, we are one. In John 15, Jesus says, I am the true vine and you are the branches. And so we, theologians talk about this as the idea of ontology, our being, and we are literally united through Jesus Christ because he is the vine, we are the branches. So I think there's very few things that should ever separate Christians other than um, a, a core theological doctrine. If someone if someone claims to believe in Jesus, but they don't believe in his divinity, I'll be relationally friends with you, but I'm not necessarily going to fellowship with you. You're probably not going to go to my church because we teach that Jesus Christ is Savior and Lord of all. He's 100% God and 100% human. So around core doctrines, yes, or issues of safety. If someone claims um, to love God, but they're, you know, violent or predatory or something. I mean, those are extreme cases, but if someone is making other people be unsafe at our church, we will confront you, we'll talk to you, but in the end, if we have to trespass you, we'll trespass you because everybody needs to feel safe. Like I'm talking about dangerous behavior. Right. But beyond that, I would think that most Christians can at least agree on the core doctrines of the faith and their love of Jesus Christ. Now they might disagree about voting matters, that they almost oftentimes will disagree depending on theological tradition about how do we do baptism, right? What's, what's church polity or ecclesiological structure? You know, do you have a top-down structure? Do you have a Anabaptist uh, flat structure? What kind of music, right? The music wars still exist, right? I like hymns, like hymns played the old way. No, I only want to hear uh, Hillsong or Elevation Worship or, right? So to me, we have to distinguish between primary core matters and then secondary and what I would consider to be less essential uh, matters. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally makes sense. Yeah, I, I'm largely on the same page. Um, I think we can sort of level some of these things for sure. Um, you know, so the, you have the four isms. I don't know what the word would be if we were to try to make it an ism like beliefism or mm. uh, scripturalism or biblicism or whatever it is. But yep. um you know, that, that first step in your wheel, yep. uh, the theological step, I mean, you know, a big one of these today is human sexuality. Yep. And yep. we, we are seeing, um, we are seeing splits and divisions yep. over this, that seem insurmountable, um, in, in some ways, like that if, if one group takes this position, you know, and the other group takes this position. Uh, both of them maybe are trying to argue from scripture. Right. They're never. They're never going to to come to an agreement. Yes. On um, the interpretation or meaning of those verses. Um, and I'll just say, like I've experienced this personally. Like, okay. Uh, 
is this is a uh, this is is fresh, very fresh. Mm. So, and I, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but I am. I'm curious about you know whether you have any any opinions on that sort of thing. Like when there is a doctrine that or, yeah. or something that seems just there's going to be no middle ground met here. Yeah. That's a great question. Thanks for bringing that up. So our denomination, the Evangelical Friends, holds to a traditional, um, I would call it traditional understanding of human sexuality as maleness and femaleness. There's maleness and there's femaleness in marriages between one man and one woman. Um, that's our traditional understanding. And yet, at the same time, we would welcome people into our church that want to come and learn about Jesus and Scripture. But it wouldn't mean that we necessarily put people that disagree with us into uh leadership positions or even membership because if you want to be a member you need to agree with the doctrine of the church so yeah i think there are things where people need to agree to disagree and i know people that hold a high view of scripture that hold a high view of the authority of jesus but they would disagree on how do we address people that are lgbtq plus right mm. so there there are people that disagree around that they're probably not going to find common consensus um, so the question is, okay, we're going to, we're going to agree, but I've even found that there are people that agree theologically, but they don't necessarily agree in how that works itself out pastorally. To what extent do we welcome people into the church and what is their role in the church, depending on their beliefs? So, yeah, right. I agree with you. There's certain things that I don't know how you would bridge those gaps and, and it's not bad, all bad because doctrine is the doctrine creates fences. It creates uh, guardrails. Like I'm not going to go to a Presbyterian and tell them you have to take on a uh, believer's baptism view because they have mm -hmm. a covenantal view of baptism. I'm not going to try and, con I mean, unless they're like trying to convince me and I'll argue from scripture, but I respect, I respect Presbyterians, even though I'm not one that have a covenant and other people have covenantal views of baptism, um, for example. So yeah, human sexuality though is different because it cuts to the core of who we are. And so people are very, very sensitive People get very worked up about it. Um, I try and be respectful in explaining our denomination's position, my understanding of scripture. And my thing, uh, Michael, is that I, in the end, I want to be respectful. Whether we disagree, agree, or agree to disagree, I want to be respectful. I never want someone to feel like I'm going after them. Now, I've said things and people are like, oh, so you're, you know, you're a bigot or you're whatever. And I said, no, I just, this is how I understand scripture. This is how my understanding of how the church has understood scripture over time and history. So that doesn't mean I hate, it doesn't mean I reject. It just means what is normative biblically, theologically, and in church history and what isn't. So yeah. I, even the language I try and use, I try and qualify it. I try and be respectful. I, I try and not be a flamethrower um, around issues of human sexuality. Like I don't want to come across as rude or jerky or caustic because every human being is made in God's image. Every single, single human being is made in God's image and therefore are of great value to God, whatever they claim their sexual gender identity is. Um, I'm still, and I, I've had hard conversations with people around this. And I say, I still respect you as a being that's made in God's image. I believe Jesus Christ died for your sins. And by the way, I've told people my, my sexuality as, as, a, as a male that is married to a female, um, my sexuality is under the lordship of Jesus, just as much as your sexuality is to be under the lordship of Jesus. I, I, God has the same standards, and I have to give account one day to God for how I used my body, as do you. So, and, and the only thing that's going to cover our sins in that regard is the blood of Jesus. Right? Mm -hmm. So I, I always try and go back to, Michael, what can we agree upon? Like, do we agree in the authority of Scripture do we agree that Jesus is Lord? If we don't agree on those things, we're probably not going to get very far in that conversation. Right. right. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and what I, I agree with that. And what makes some of this really tricky, like in my own experience, like uh, recently, when you're part of a denomination and uh, that, you know, they have a, a discipline or a polity, you yep. know, a, a theological perspective and you take ordination vows to yep. uphold those yet in time there will be some within said denomination that go rogue yeah their their views change yet instead of i think doing the right and honorable thing and and bowing out 
they right. attempt to stay and it fractures they, they start creating fractures from within yeah. the denomination um and you know those are those are really those are really tough things to deal with man yeah um, yeah i'm sure you know that you're aware of that but um I so am. that the, the I am. reconciliation there is often it, it it often seems like you can never get around to it because uh, there's just too wide of a gap at yeah. that point, you know? Um, and then, you know, the, the other part of the title unity, I and mean, this is an interesting word to me. I, I just published an essay about a year ago in a book on biblical sexuality about unity mm-hmm. and in my little first commentary in first Corinthians and talk about this, but how unity isn't always a good thing, right? You can unite around sure. bad things. Yes, um, yes. A, a unity can become unhealthy and even idolatrous, I think, in yes. some, some instances. Yes. Um, so those two things, man, reconciliation, unity, those are hard. <laughs> yeah, amen. <laughs> I, I agree with you, Michael. And again, it's not at all costs. Like, first off, reconciliation is we're called to reconcile, to be reconciled to God because as sinners, right. we st- God's wrath is arrayed against us. And, and um, you know, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And you read Romans, it's pretty clear to me um, that God's wrath, which is his, his righteousness and his justice, God is not some parent flying off the handle at the teenager that left their underwear on the floor. God's, right. God is just, God is holy, God is righteous. So God has to deal with sin. He cannot allow sin to contaminate him, um, but also to destroy us as the beings he loves. And that's why he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die so that we can be reconciled. We can go from being God's enemies to being God's adopted, dearly loved children, where we can be um, uh, go from, you know, God's wrath is arrayed against us to being um, declared righteous, forensically righteous. So we need reconciliation first with God. And I hope. Most Christians, I hope all Christians would agree that's the first step in reconciliation because I can't reconcile with you if I don't have, if my sinful nature is still ascendant, if I'm still enslaved to my sinful nature as the Apostle Paul talks about in Romans 6, um, I can't really be made right with you because I'm still, my sinful nature is running the show. So I need to be made right with God who crucifies through Jesus my sinful nature and um, gives me this new nature, gives me the Holy Spirit that can empower me to live a righteous life because the Holy Spirit gives us the fruit of the Spirit. And we have the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ, which means we're forensically righteous. God gives us his righteousness through his son. Um, So we need that. Then Christians can live, though, as Jesus said, we're to be peacemakers. And I believe in the Sermon on the Mount, he is talking to about this alternative kingdom that Christians are to embody. We can be peacemakers, but right. we also have Jesus saying, right? He came to bring a sword. He came to yeah. he came to divide. And that was against the, as I interpret that, the Pharisees who were religious, um, hypo- they, were hip- they were hypocritical. Um, and they, Jesus says, what? You're, you're whitewashed on the outside, but you're what? You're dirty, gross, clean, sinful, Uh, judgmental in the worst possible way on the inside. So first we got to be reconciled with God, but then we can be reconciled one to the other through the blood of Jesus Christ. Because in Ephesians two, it says God through Jesus has torn down the dividing wall of hostility between Jews and Gentiles so that now they are one body. Mm -hmm. So that that's what, but yet we still retain different ethnicities. We still are male and female, like, being reconciled and united actually doesn't uh, erase all distinctions right because michael one of the key texts i look at is and i this is my opinion i'd be curious what you think i look at revelation 7 which we talk about in the book as a porthole into heaven the apostle john gets a porthole into heaven and he sees every tribe tongue nation and people group and they're worshiping the lamb who was slain and 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 he can see John says they're every tribe, tongue, nation and people group, which means when people go to heaven, they're not whitewashed like eggs in a carton. They're not all brown eggs or white eggs. He can see that there's something of their ethnicity that's been retained. He can see that they're male and female. They're not all male or all female. He can tell they're from the majority world, from the southern hemisphere, northern hemisphere. 
Um, and undoubtedly, the people that were there had different economic stations in life. There were some that are rich, there were some that are poor, there are some that are middle class, there are some that are formally educated and some that were never formally educated. Um, and yet they're diverse and yet they have two things uniting them. They, their object of worship, the lamb who was slain, and it says they're wearing these white robes, which I believe are the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. And I believe that's happening in heaven right now. And yeah. I believe that is what will happen uh, in the new heavens and the new earth, the new creation, the new Jerusalem for all eternity. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, I'm on board with that. Um, yeah, you know, like uh, as you're talking there, like um, that sounds radically different than this sort of neo-Marxism. And I'm not just trying to be trendy here sure. to like talk about sure. neo-Marxism or say yeah. neo-Marxism. Like, but, you know, like, uh, I assume you're familiar with sort of the Marxist wheel, right? Yep. Where, where on top you have one group and then has an equal and opposing group on the bottom of the wheel. And um, everything is sort of dichotomous. And so you have rich, poor, black, white, yep. you know, gay, yep. straight, uh, what, whatever, 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 whatever. And it seems to me that looking at the world through that lens is highly problematic mm -hmm. uh, when, when you're sort of dividing, when, when you look at people and that's like all you see. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and then it's, it's more problematic with sort of Marxism and neo-Marxism to want to like take the wheel and turn it to, you know, take those who are on the bottom of it and put them on top and take right. those who are on the bottom. Well, um, so obviously that's a simplistic sort of explanation of it, but right. that seems like very, very divisive to me. Mm -hmm. And, um, it, what, it, what it does is it, dude, we're all complex humans. Yep. Like, and like, as a, as a Christian, as someone who somewhat reluctantly these days still would probably call myself an evangelical, mm. um, <laughs> Like I, you know, I, I, that, that sort of thing makes me uncomfortable precisely for the reason that you were just saying, you're, you're referencing revelation, every nation, uh, yeah. tongue, tribe, like, um, I don't know, man. I, I, I'm just curious of your thoughts on that. Like, yeah, I, I mean, you already talked about this. Generalizations are. They can be funny and humor, but they can also be destructive if we just paint, you know, groups of people uh, a certain way. Like every, all of you are like, no, that's not true. You know, um, I think God understands that every single one of us are made in his image. Um, and yet, what does it say in Psalm 139? We're fearfully and wonderfully made. We're like we're both all in God's image. Um, and each and every one of us is distinct and that God created us. And the whole sanctity of life is that God cares in the details of each and every person, their personality, their uh, intelligence, emotional intelligence, intellectual intelligence, um, their artistic creativity, yeah, their yeah, physical there's, there's a complexity. There's a complexity there. Like, yeah. oh, I'm sorry to cut you off, but there's a complexity there. And like the generalizations are funny. I believe that they can be funny. Rather. Right. But right. there is also a complexity. Like yeah. and as an evangelical, like, that's why I've never fit into this party or that party like very nicely. Yep. You know, I have these kingdom values that are at odds with this and this party and this and this party and this and this social group. And so like th there's, it's, it's just, we're way more complex um, than we're often given credit for. And like, I think looking at it just through that sort of like bi dichotomous binary lens is very, yeah. can be very divisive. Yes. Know. Yes. And especially yeah. when it's used to, you know, beat up another person or group or, um, right. We, we weaponize part of yeah. the world we live in is, I mean, this has always been this way. We weaponize information. Um, we weaponize difference. We weaponize unity. Everybody has to do this. Everybody has to. And it's right. like, well, wait a second. Right. No, that's not unity. Unity Unity has, I would say, diversity within it, even God. So, Michael, the thing that I that blew my mind is when I did Ph.D. studies over in the U.K., um, 
everybody had read a lot. It was expected that we'd read um, a lot about the Trinity. And I remember when I was in seminary years before, I'd read some about the Trinity, but in Europe, theological circles, the Trinity was even bigger. We need to know more about uh, the Trinity in se and ex se, the, the social Trinity, and then the, uh, the, the Trinity that's outward facing, economic Trinity, we could say. And so, but the, we've, we've emphasized in the Western world, the unity of God, there, God is one, there is one God, but there's also three persons within the one God. So even within God's self, we could say uh, right. there is unity and diversity. You have one being equal in power and glory, but you have three persons. Otherwise you have modalism. You have three God showing up in three different ways, which is not what small o Orthodox Christianity teaches. We teach that there's three different persons. So that's a great structure right there in the nature yes. of God of both unity and diversity. The problem is we tend to say everybody's got to be the same or everybody's got to be different. And we can't hold both in tension. We struggle to hold both unity and diversity in tension because that is, but that's actually how the world works. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Very, very much so. Um, man. Well, th dude, this has been a really fun conversation for me. I, I hope it has for you, um, uh, Paul. Yeah. I've really enjoyed meeting you and getting to chat. I, I'm grateful that you've cut some time out today to talk. And yeah. um, I, I want to encourage everybody out there watching or listening, go pick up a copy of Preaching to a Divided Nation, a seven-step model for promoting reconciliation and unity by Matthew Kim and Paul Hoffman. And keep an eye out. That's with Baker, by the way. <laughs> keep an eye out for the Paul's book um, uh, coming out maybe this April on yep. AI. Yep. That sounds pretty fascinating. Hopefully we can get you back on to, yeah. to talk about that. But man, keep up the great work. Congrats on the book award. Thank um, you. Yeah, well done on that. And uh, yeah, so um, after you've picked up a copy of those books, head over to glosahouse.com and check that out. We're always dropping new resources over there. Um, we just dropped at the, at the time of recording this. Um, uh, November 18th, we just dropped a new Greek work yesterday or today. Um, so that's fun and uh, more on the horizon. But um, again, Paul, man, great to meet you. Yeah. And uh, blessings to you on your ministry, your writing ministry, your your pastoral ministry, and mm. you know all the ministries that you're wrapped up <laughs> in. Uh, but all right, friends, we are going to wrap it up there. We'll, we'll stop there and say we hope that helps. Interested in growing your ancient language skills, but not sure where to start? Glow's House can help. From illustrated readers and short stories to lexicons and grammars, Glossa House offers a variety of resources for beginning, intermediate, and experienced ancient language learners. Head to glossahouse.com today. Glossa House, language resources for the global community.